I'm Tom Long. Why don't you join me on the beach for a few minutes to consider the message of Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 through 13 and 18 through 26. Let's head over this dune and find a quiet place. Those of us with an evangelical uh, bent to our faith often frame Jesus' call as one to faith. This harkens back to it at least, I don't know, Martin Luther and his Sola Fidelis, Faith Alone. I did this to the extent that growing up in the age of Billy Graham Crusades, I saw his altar call as simply being a call to saving faith. Yet in the New Testament, I can find only two places where Jesus tells the disciples, believe in me. But at least 29 times, Jesus initiates relationships with people by saying, follow me. And even in the Bible, there are a variety of ways in which people respond to Jesus' invitation. No, to Jesus' command. Some, like the rich young ruler, weigh the cost of discipleship and respond to Jesus, I'm okay, you go on without me. Others, like Moses, have a discussion, a dialogue with God. Who, me? You don't want me. Hey, how about my brother over there? Yet there is another response. Consider Abram. God said, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you." And how does the Bible say Abram responded? It says simply, so Abram went. And on the second Sunday after Pentecost, our Gospel reading tells us that Jesus, whom John identifies as the Creator Word God, Jesus walks up to the toll booth of a tax collector named Matthew. Quite possibly the very scoundrel that had been collecting taxes for the Romans on the fish caught by Peter, Andrew, James, and John, disciples he had already called. I'm guessing they didn't love what Jesus said to the despised tax collector. You guessed it. Follow me. And how did Matthew respond? Matthew got up and followed him, the Bible says. So in this story, Matthew is a throwback to the likes of Abram. So Abram went to the likes of Isaiah, who said, here am I, send me. And this scandalized the traditionalists and religious establishment. To add insult to injury, that is the injury to cultural expectations, Jesus accepts an invitation to party at Matthew's with his band of tax collectors and sinner friends. And the Pharisees saw this and asked, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I'm reminded of how many times I've been told that the church is full of hypocrites. In this week's Gospel reading, the Pharisees made the same sort of accusation. What kind of rabbi hangs out with tax collectors and other unsavory characters? On top of going to a tax collector and sinner's party, Jesus engaged a woman with an issue of blood later in our passage. And that issue of blood would have made her unclean. Although Jesus taught us that this wasn't the case, at that time, illness and death were seen as punishment for sin. And Jesus went to help a synagogue leader whose daughter was sick and died. He did this in spite of the fact that the synagogue leaders in general worked against Jesus. The hypocrites we see in the church are often the same ilk as, the, as those uh, Jesus calls in the Bible. The church is full of sinners who by God's grace believe that we can go to Jesus to get help, get healed, be lifted up from however far down we found ourselves, and maybe reach out a hand and like Abram become a blessing to others around us. Meanwhile, the people with power and prestige 
stand outside Jesus' circle, self-righteously looking down on us. The mourners for Jairus' daughter even laughed at Jesus. But in verses 12 and 13, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. <laughs> this group of messy ragtag sinners is the seed of what will become the church. And we will continue to fellowship with those the self-righteous find objectionable. We will continue to provide ministries of healing for those with medical, mental, addiction, or counseling needs. We will continue to stand with those who walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like Jairus' daughter, and offer hope. We will offer our love and support both to the LGBTQ community and to the bigots that oppose them without thinking one person is more valuable than the other. We will welcome people from the political right, left, and center, establishment people, and outcasts. God's love for the whole world turns the concept of culture wars in Bible times and now. God's love turns the concept of culture wars on its head. All are welcome to party with Jesus. We all have a choice. We can stand on the outside and look down on the messy, sin-riddled, socially ostracized, sick, and unclean people who flock to Jesus. We can laugh at their promise of life when death and destruction are everywhere. Or we too can choose to come to Jesus with all of our baggage, not only to find our own redemption, but to show compassion and love to those all around us who, like us, need our Savior's love.